Well, welcome to the hills. I greet all of you online and at West Fort Worth, Keller, and North Richmond Hills campuses. I need to begin with a big thank you. Last Sunday, I mentioned my father was near death. He actually passed away early Monday morning. This past week, uh, my brother's family and my family have been overwhelmed with expressions and with deeds of kindness to the degree that I cannot adequately respond as I would like to all of the love that has been expressed to us. So just know it has been genuinely appreciated. Someone asked me one time if you could feel prayers. Yes, you can. You can feel when you're prayed for, and I have felt it, and I felt your love. So thank you so much. Uh, we love this church. My dad loved this church. I'm wearing a golf vest today in honor of him, and I'll say more about him in a moment. Right now, I'd like you to open your Bibles to 1 Peter. Find chapter 1 as you are. I'll tell you about a Sunday school teacher who let her children out into the church courtyard to play before Bible class began. When she called them in at the start of class, one little boy had his new Sunday clothes absolutely soiled because he had been playing in the mud. Frustrated, the teacher said, young man, the Bible says cleanliness is next to what? He said, it is next to impossible. <laughs> it is next to impossible to stay clean. You will get dirty unless you intend not to. And not just in an external or a physical sense. So our theme for 1 Peter is living hope. Peter is writing to people he called elect exiles. All through the letter, there is a theme that you are aliens, but the strange thing is they haven't moved. They are living where they are living all their lives, but suddenly they are strange to their neighbors because the way they are following Jesus has changed them. So what Peter wants to do is encourage them to remain odd for God, motivated by a living hope in the resurrection of Jesus and one of the ways this is going to play out is that we are going to live as aliens in a polluted world, meaning to stay clean, to avoid being soiled by the behaviors and the ideas of our culture. And so we ended last week in verse 12. Now, verse 13 of chapter 1, therefore... With minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. It's not hard to figure out what the main idea is. Last week, we talked about living hope in the salvation of God, but today in the holiness of God. Did you know it is the attribute of God mentioned more than any other in both Testaments? Not His love, not His mercy, not His grace, not His faithfulness, not His wisdom. In the Old Testament and in the New Testament, no attribute of God is mentioned more than His holiness. God is set apart. God is transcendently different. And God wants his children to look like their father. Be holy, because I am holy. In fact, that's why you were chosen. That's why he elected you. Ephesians 1 verse 4, in Christ, he chose us before the world was made so that we would be his holy people. That's what God wants. God wants a holy people. What do I mean by that? What does it mean to be set apart? Let's suppose it's March Madness and I invite my good friend E.J. Brown to come over to my house to watch a little basketball with me. He comes over early for some supper. He doesn't know and he sits in the chair at my table where I usually sit. It's kind of set apart for me. I'm not going to tell E.J. to get up and move. That chair is low level holiness. He walks into the den. He gets in the recliner I usually sit in. I'm not going to make him get up. That's low-level holiness. He might even say, Pastor Rick, 
I had a good workout at the gym before I came over, worked up a sweat. Could I take a shower? I would let him go into my shower and use my towel. And then that sucker says, and Pastor Rick, can I use your toothbrush? He just crossed the line. (laughs) My toothbrush is high level holiness. It is set apart only for me. To be holy is to acknowledge that we belong exclusively to God. We exist for His agenda and for His glory. And one way we do that, since God is light and no darkness lives in Him, is that we intend to live lives that do not get soiled by the behaviors and beliefs of a godless culture. We'll see next week, chapter 2, verse 11. Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from the worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. Be holy, because I'm holy. God is not giving a suggestion. He is issuing the standard. But it's hard when holiness makes you odd. So how do you motivate people to be odd for God in the area of holiness? Now, one way you can do it is with warnings. The Bible does that sometimes. I love retelling the story of the middle school in Oregon years ago. The young girls, as they reached teenage years, were putting on makeup. They were putting on lipstick in the bathroom and leaving lip prints on the mirrors. The brilliant principal got all the girls in the bathroom and said, ladies, when you kiss the mirrors with your lipstick, it's hard to clean. She turned to the custodian, show the girls how hard it is to clean. He took his squeegee, dipped it in the toilet and began to clean the mirrors. And they've had no more problems with the girls kissing the mirrors. So one way you warn people to be clean is you give them a possibility of a judgment. But that's not what Peter does. Peter gives them a reminder of living hope. How did he start this whole section about holiness? He said, set your hope on the grace that's going to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed. Do you remember a few weeks ago we had the ice in the snow and we were locked in the houses and we all got on TV and we looked at the forecast and we had hope because a few days the sun was coming back. And that's what Peter is saying. I have seen the forecast and the sun is coming back. And so what he's saying is that living hope produces holy living. You see, we are on a pilgrimage to meet Jesus. And people on their way to see a king mean to stay clean. If you were given an audience with the president of our country, whether you voted for him or not, you know you would take a bath and put on some clean clothes. You are on the way to meet King Jesus. Shouldn't that motivate you to want to be holy? Look how John puts it. Dear friends, now we're children of God. And we've not yet been shown what will be in the future, but we know that when Christ comes again, we will be like him because we will see him as he really is. Christ is pure. And all who have this hope in Christ keep themselves pure like Christ. Do you know what word in the Bible is used of us more than any other in the New Testament? It's not Christian. It's not brother and sister. It's the word saint. That's what God calls you more than anything else. The set apart, the holy ones. God chose us because he wants a holy people. We are the odd squad. We are swimming upstream in a downstream world because we want to look like our father more than we want to fit in with the culture. So how do we do that? Well, Peter's about to tell us. And I'm about to read a long text. I know sometimes it's hard to hang in with long text. I just want to remind you people, these are the words of God. They're more important than anything else I'm going to say. So lean in and let's hear what the Holy Spirit says about how to live a holy life. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as forwarders here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, 
but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. So your faith and your hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind, like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you've tasted that the Lord is good. And as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God, And precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusted him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe this stone is precious, but, but to those who do not believe, The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. So what Peter's doing is he's carrying through this big idea. God wants a holy people. And what's that going to look like? One thing for sure, it's going to make us weird. And here's how. Number one, we display holiness through purity. Remember what John said, all that have this hope in Christ keep themselves pure like Christ. And so go back and look at what Peter told us to do. He said, don't conform to evil desires that you had when you lived in ignorance. He said, you were redeemed from the empty way of life you had before you met Jesus. He said, you have purified yourself when you obeyed the truth. He said, you need to get rid of things like malice and envy and hypocrisy and slander, things that were normal before you knew Jesus. Now, remember, the standard for holiness is not the dude down the street. The most half committed Christian ought to be able to live a purer life than a completely godless fellow saying, well, I don't want to sin too much is like a soldier saying, when I go to war, I don't want to get shot too much. Your standard for holiness is not the guy down the street. Your standard for holiness is Jesus. You want to live like Jesus would live if Jesus was living in your body, which by the way, he is. Folks, it is impossible for me today to overemphasize to you the impact the early church had on her world because of her commitment to purity. The early church's moral ethic was awesome, and it was odd. There have been so many people trying to ask the question, how did the church survive? A poor, uneducated, powerless group of Jewish itinerants that becomes a movement that overcomes the most mighty empire the world's ever seen. How did that happen? It didn't happen because they accommodated and said, we will change our values to fit in so that you will not pick on us. It happened because the church resolutely said, we are going to offer a counter narrative to the story everybody else is hearing. They've noticed five ways that early Christians in their moral code were absolutely odd. One was their commitment to nonviolence. They took Jesus seriously. Love your enemies. They said to the Romans, you can kill us. We're not picking up swords and killing you back. So odd. Another was their commitment to radical generosity. Their belief that people with much ought to help people with little. There was nothing like that in the ancient world. 
The parable of the Good Samaritan, nobody else taught such a thing. Their commitment to poor people was so odd. Another was their resolute stance on the sanctity of life. The early church opposed abortion, which was practiced in the Roman world, and they opposed the more common practice of infant exposure. In that day, if you had a child and you didn't want that child, and that typically meant it was a girl, you could take the child to a dump and let it die. And the Christians would come along, even though they didn't have much means themselves, and they would pick up all these babies and take them into their houses. They were so strange. Another strange thing about the early Christians was their commitment to multi-ethnicity. The early world had never seen anything where people would gather in the same home, different races, different tongues, different nationalities, different economic stratas, and they would get together around the same table and call each other brother and sister. That was so weird. And maybe most of all, the strangest thing about the early church was their rigid sexual ethic. The early church was resolute. For hundreds of years, there was no change on this. Sex belongs only in a heterosexual marriage. One man and one woman married for life. And they did not compromise that. Now, in the world they lived, that was weird. The Roman culture basically said sex is whoever, however, whenever. Just like we say today. The idea is that we need to liberate sex. So we've had our sexual liberation since the 60s. And what has it brought us? Look at the statistics. Our families are more broken than ever. Divorce is rampant. More kids than ever grow up without mothers and fathers. Teenage mental illness is skyrocketing. You show me the data that sexual liberation has made us a better society. Because what happens is when we say we're taking all the strings off sex, we're going to divorce sex from marriage, we're going to divorce sex from uh, children, we're going to divorce sex from commitment and romance, it simply becomes a game of who's got the most power. And that almost always means the weak, which almost always means the children and the women suffer the most. This is one reason why women were so attracted to the early churches. In a culture where they were taught they exist simply to satisfy the lust of powerful men, they heard a message that said, you are an equal image bearer of God, and you deserve the loving, loyal affection of one man only. In fact, there was another interesting phenomenon. Remember, they would take these little girls and put them in the dumps. Well, what happens then in a culture where there are more boys than girls when it's time to marry? Where can I find women to marry? You know where they were? They were in the churches. And so these dudes have got to go to these churches and they meet these girls who say, "Uh, uh, uh-uh-uh, I'm a daughter of God and I'm going to be treated like one. It is impossible to overemphasize how much the early church blessed their culture by their solid, strong commitment to purity. Now, as I was writing the sermon, immediately a passage came to my mind. I think of a lot, a lot. First Thessalonians four. And I thought, well, that's a long passage. That's probably too long to read. This has never happened in 40 years. I'm telling you the truth. In 40 years, this has never happened. I heard the Holy Spirit say, somebody needs to hear this. So I'm going to read it because somebody needs to hear this. God wants you to be holy. And stay away from sexual sins. He wants each of you to learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable. Don't use your body for sexual sin like the people who do not know God. Also, don't wrong or cheat another Christian in this way. The Lord will punish people who do those things. As we've already told you and warned you. God called us to be holy. and does not want us to live in sin. So the person who refuses to obey this teaching is disobeying God, not simply a human teaching. And God is the one who gives us his Holy Spirit. Somebody needed to hear that. 
Maybe because you're committing sexual sin and God is calling you to repentance. He's warning you. Maybe because you're under a lot of pressure to stop believing the Christian sexual ethic. Maybe it's because you've lived in ignorance and you didn't know this is what God wanted. Maybe God wants someone to hear this because it's hard to be odd. It's hard to be pure. And God wants to encourage you to keep doing what you're doing. We don't need to apologize for our ethic. We make the world better when we practice it. And remember, this is why God gave you the Holy Spirit. God trusted you with the gift of his Holy Spirit. It's not like, well, I'm going to clean up and then I'm going to come to Jesus. No, I'm going to come to Jesus. And Jesus is going to give me his Holy Spirit to help me start living the life that God wants me to live. We bless the world when we're God's odd squad. There's a letter from the second century called Letter to Diagnotus. We don't know who that is, but it's a letter describing what Christians are like. It's so interesting. Let me read part of it. There's something extraordinary about their lives. They live in their own countries as though they're only passing through. They play their full role as citizens, but labor under all the disabilities of aliens. Any country can be their homeland, but for them, their homeland, wherever it may be, is a foreign country. Like others, they marry and have children but they do not expose them. They share their meals, but not their wives. They live in the flesh, but they're not governed by the desires of the flesh. They pass their days on earth, but they're citizens of heaven. We need more press like that. When I was a boy, one of my favorite memories of my dad was taking me to Dallas Cowboy Games at the Cotton Bowl. And this was my favorite player. His name was Roger Staubach. And my favorite memory of him was not on the field. He was on a TV set. He's being interviewed by Phyllis George. And she says, Roger, how do you feel when you see Joe Namath, who's so sexually active and has a different girl in his arm every time you see him? Roger fired right back. I'm just as sexually active as Joe. It's just that all of mine is with one woman. Mic drop. (laughs) Now you know why the Cowboys used to be God's favorite football team. So let me say again, the blood of Jesus Christ has freed us from ways of living that are worthless and baseless and dehumanizing and our neighbors need our witness. Let's be odd for God when it comes to purity. And then another way we display holiness is maturity. He said, grow up in your salvation. We belong exclusively to God so that we can become increasingly like God. So what are the signs that we're growing up in our salvation? What are the signs that we're growing in maturity? Peter said there are two. One is an increased hunger for God's word. He said, you've been born again by the living and enduring word of God. Crave pure spiritual milk. When you have a passion to become a holy person, you love the word of God. Last month, a guy named Keith Stonehouse in Washington, doorbell rings, Grubhub, I didn't order any food, sits down, doorbell ring, Grubhub, I didn't order any food, sits down, doorbell rings, he suddenly realized his little six-year-old son Mason had found his phone and got hungry. Before the night was over, he had ordered $1,000 of hot dogs and chili cheese fries and pizza. And father had to give his son a, a lesson about how we do our diet around here. Well, listen, your father in heaven cares about your diet. He wants you to grow in holiness, and that's why he wants you to feed and live on the Word of God. Now, I loved Israel, but I got to tell you, I've had all the pita bread and hummus I need for a while. (laughs) Within 24 hours of being back in America, I had a cheeseburger, I had Mexican food, I had a chicken biscuit. Don't you judge me. Some foods simply say, this shows the country and the nation I belong to. (laughs) And if we belong to God, we show the world by our diet. And it's our diet on the word that helps us stay holy. Look at the Old Testament. I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. The New Testament. I write to you, young men, because you're strong and the word of God lives in you. And you've overcome the evil one. One of my reflections in Israel, how did the Jewish people survive all these years? Thousands of years. They're odd. They're surrounded by hostility. I'm convinced part of it is their commitment to the Torah, 
to the Word of God. We went to the Temple Mount, the Western Wall, the only part of the Temple Mount that was still standing when Jesus was alive. Men will go to one side, women to the other. Watch this video. I went into one room by the men's side. And there's Orthodox Jews. And you know what they're nodding? This is how they memorize. They've learned this since they were boys. They're not memorizing verses. They're memorizing books. Those men could quote the first five books of the Bible. This is how they stay odd for God. When we fill up on truth, we grow up in salvation. What does it look like to be mature? It means that you have an increased hunger for God's Word and an increased love for God's people. You notice again, look at verse 22. Peter said, now that your obedience to the truth has purified your souls, you can have true love for your Christian brothers and sisters. So love each other deeply. Know what he said? It's when you get into the Word that you're able to love people better. It's impossible to love the truth and hate your Christian family. Don't think you ever have to choose between love and truth. It's not truth or love. It's truth that issues in love. This is why the Bible says Jesus was full of grace and truth. I stood on the steps a few weeks ago where Jesus stood when they brought a woman and they threw her on the floor or the ground and said, she was caught in adultery. What should we do? And after he had dismissed her hypocritical accusers, he said, I don't condemn you. That's a word of grace. Now go and sin no more. And that's a word of truth. And that's what holiness looks like. We can't love people by ignoring God's Word, and we don't love God's Word if we ignore people. And so we're putting God's holiness on display through our purity and our maturity, and we're doing it as a family. And this is the last big idea that I really want you to lean into. We display holiness in community. Did you notice every metaphor Peter uses to motivate passion for holiness is corporate, obedient children, Newborn babies, living stones, holy priesthood. Now notice that Peter says, you can't stay neutral on Jesus. You've got to make a decision. He's either the rock or he's a stumbling block. Peter says, the resurrection has convinced me he's not just the rock, he's the cornerstone. He's the foundation of everything God is building. And what is God building? He says, God is building a spiritual house. Now, this is important. That God wants to put his holiness on display through us together as a holy community. Let me illustrate like this. Every parent knows what this is. This is a Lego block. You know what it is because you stepped on one in the middle of the night and had to put your hand over your mouth to keep from saying a bad word. You don't ever put this on display and say, look what my child does. My child can hold a Lego block. Here's what you put on display. Your child gets his blocks out, and he builds a Luke Skywalker X-Wing fighter. (laughs) Now, your child builds that, and you post it and say, look what my child built with all those blocks. This is so cool. Only a Jedi Knight or a senior pastor even ought to have one. And by the way, it's staying in my office, so don't even ask. (laughs) Now, here's the point. God isn't just making you holy, or you holy, or you holy. He's making us holy together. And what God is doing is he's building a temple, and it's an amazing temple. The world's never seen a temple like this temple, because this temple is getting built out of stones, out of all kinds of different quarries, ethnically different, gender different, socioeconomic different. And God's taking all these stones and he's putting them together in the same house. He's building a holy temple with all these different stones. Ephesians 2, together we're his house built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We're carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Get this. This is why you're coming to church matters. This is why being in a small group matters. This is why having Christian community matters. Because God wants to put his holiness on display through the house that he's building. Not just through a stone. It's together. 
that our oddness displays the holiness of God. And God has always wanted a people that would do this. He's always wanted a people that would represent him and tell his side of the story. And so notice how the text ends. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you've received mercy. Oh, it's brilliant what God's doing. He's building a holy temple to send the message that I'm rebuilding the entire creation that has been broken by sin. And we're the messengers. They said to Jesus, tell those people to stop praising you. We said, if I did, the stones would cry out. Well, we're now the stones. And we cry out. And we let the world know what God is doing. And it's our holiness that gives our message weight. I'd said living hope produces holy living. But here's the other side. Holy living proclaims living hope. When we live differently, we give our message weight. When we're willing to seem odd, it's because we know we're going to see Jesus. We're on our way to meet our King. And that's why we stay holy. So let me close quickly with a few thoughts about my dad. He left me many lessons and legacies. But maybe one of his best gifts was this. He taught me it's okay to be odd. When we went and visited extended family and they weren't Christians, we got up on Sunday morning and we went to church. When my brother and I played youth sports and they had practices on Wednesday night, my dad would pull up in the station wagon. He would call our names and Mark and I would walk away from the rest of the team, change clothes in the station wagon, and go to church. Because it was okay to be odd. I remember canvassing neighborhoods with my dad asking people in total cold calls if they would like to have Bible studies. Not many said yes. But I have great memories of standing by my dad thinking, he really believes this stuff, doesn't he? When he was on business trips with Sears, he didn't go to the bars and the strip clubs. The guys finally stopped asking. In fact, they gave my dad their wallets so that they wouldn't spend too much money and have to explain to their wives when they got home where all the money went to. Jim was odd, but they respected him. What a beautiful gift. My dad taught me it's okay to be odd for God. The day before he died, I was speaking over him. I don't know if he could hear me or not, but I was telling him I loved him, thanking him for these lessons, telling him it was okay to go home. He got very agitated. And so I just started to sing one of his favorite songs over him, and he calmed down. I like to think you heard it. It was one of his favorite songs because it says, just one glimpse of him in glory will the toils of life repay. It's going to be so worth it when we meet a king. So there's a tribute to my dad. I'd like you to stand up. Every campus, even online, and I'd like to sing that song. You're going to have to help me. There's no band. There's no praise team. Just a raspy voided pastor. Okay? <laughs> but sing it with me. And think about what we're thinking about. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing His mercy and His grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, He'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. 
When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of Him in glory will the toils of life repay. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Yeah. Right now, I feel like I can hear my dad saying, stay on, son. It's so worth it. So, Father, thank you. Thank you for choosing a people to be your own. For rescuing us from worthless and wasteful ways of living. For freeing us for the kind of life that doesn't just honor you, but blesses the world. So give us more passion, more courage, more resilience to live the odd life. And give us boldness. So when people say, but why do you do the strange things you do? We can say, because we're on our way to meet Jesus. Would you like to come and meet Jesus with us? We pray in His name. Amen.